This video was sponsored by CuriosityStream, home to over 2,500 documentaries and nonfiction titles for curious minds. Here we have the graph of sine of sine x plus cosine y equals cosine of sine x y plus cosine x. And although it looks crazy, it actually has some interesting applications. No, I'm just kidding. Or maybe I'm not. But as far as I know, I'm just kidding. Now, the reason I'm showing this is really because it's funny. And the only reason I was able to find this curve was because it was in a book called Curse for the Mathematically Curious, which is a more technical book, but for the math enthusiasts, you may enjoy it. Anyways, several curves in mathematics do have applications. I'll get to more advanced ones later, but we learned several of these in high school, right? Like parabolas or sinusoids or logarithms and more like that. But often just any randomly picked curve doesn't really have applications or at least not obvious ones. It just looks pretty or cool or really weird, or it has some unique property. For example, take the Weierstrass function. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. This is a curve that's continuous everywhere, but differentiable nowhere. If you've taken calculus, you know a curve like this with a sharp corner or one with a cusp is continuous, but not differentiable at that sharp point. Well, this function is continuous. There are no holes or breaks anywhere, but again, differentiable nowhere. So you could kind of say it's infinitely jagged. And if you zoom in, you see it behaves like a fractal. This isn't super applicable, but it was the first function discovered to have this continuous everywhere differentiable nowhere property. Even less useful though, is the Einstein curve. It's a very simple set of parametric equations, I'm sure everyone can understand this, and what you get when you plot it is Einstein. I just found this on Wolfram Alpha, but the fact that even a computer could determine this is quite impressive. And they have more like the Santa curve or the warrior pose yoga curve and so on. So not very applicable, but definitely artistic. However, there is a kind of curve that has applications when it comes to art, like Photoshop and video editing software, more like that. And those would be Bezier curves. Now, this is an entire family of curves that's found based on a certain number of control points. For example, with two control points, we can construct a linear Bezier curve, which isn't too exciting. But with three control points, we can make a quadratic Bezier as follows. First, imagine two extra points moving from one to two and then two to three respectively in the same amount of time. Those spinning numbers are basically percentages of the completed path and they always match. Now I'm gonna do the same thing again, but add in a third dot that moves along that purple connecting line from one end to the other, also in the same amount of time. The path that dot traces out is a quadratic Bezier curve. Then for a cubic Bezier, you need four control points with a bunch of other connecting points slash lines that follow. This then continues to higher order curves, which I won't show, and it does just take watching these a few times to see how they work. Credit to Jason Davies for coding this, by the way, very useful. One thing to notice is that the location of the control points determines what the curves will look like entirely. And also in most cases, the curves in red don't touch every single one of those control points, like this one for that quadratic Bezier. Now, if we have these four points, the associated cubic Bezier curve would be this here. It might not touch points two and three. However, if we draw tangent lines just at the ends here, then those will always intersect some other points. And this makes it a little easier to predict the look of these curves, because if I move one point around, then we still get that same behavior. Taking this to computer graphics, in Premiere Pro, when I use the pen tool and just click two points, then I get a linear Bezier curve. But instead, if I click once and then click and drag a second time, I get a quadratic Bezier, which is defined by these three points. No, that fourth one doesn't do anything yet. And then I can adjust the shape however I want. But that fourth point does come in when I click and hold again, because now we get a cubic Bezier curve defined by these four points. So what we have here is a quadratic attached to a completely separate cubic Bezier curve, kind of like a piecewise function. These two points are thus for two totally different curves. But by forcing them to both be on this tangent line and move together, then we don't have to worry about a corner here. It'll always be smooth. 
And believe it or not, cubics and quadratics are the main curves you'll see in computer graphics. Connecting them together over and over allows for much more complex shapes. And since a Bezier curve is defined by the location of those control points, placing them strategically allows us to create basically whatever we want. And yes, this is used to create fonts, computer graphics, and more. That might have been a new type of curve for some of you, but this next one will probably be more familiar, and that's the Lemnus Gate. Although you've probably never seen it like this. The Lemnus Gate is basically a figure eight, but here we have a specific kind called the Lemnus Gate of Bernoulli. It has two focus points, and mathematically this is defined as all the points where if you take the distance from each focus and multiply those values together, you get some constant, regardless of where you are on the curve. But you can also make the shape like this. First we attach a rod from the left focus to 0, 1, then from there to 0, negative 1, and from there to the other focus to get this linkage here. Now imagine the focus points are pinned, they cannot move, but the other joints can. Since the rods are rigid, then this one can only move along this circle that goes off screen, and this other one can only move along this circle. Now if you put a dot in the center of that yellow rod and allow everything to rotate, that dot will sweep out the Lemnus Gate of Bernoulli. This is common in robotics, for example, to look at all the connections and see what path is swept out by some point. And one famous example of this is Watt's linkage. Here's the animation you'd find on Wikipedia. The configuration consists of three rods, and with this setup, the center point can only move in a nearly straight line up and down. This was actually used in Watt's patent for the steam engine in the late 1700s, and still to this day the linkage applies to suspensions for different types of vehicles to ensure there's no horizontal motion. Now another curve you can create with something physical is the cycloid, as this is the path that one point on a wheel traces out. I'm sure many of you know where this is going, but this relates to the brachistochrone curve. This curve answers the question of, given two points at different heights, what shape slide, with no friction, minimizes the time it takes for an object to slide from point A to point B? Naturally, many people say the shortest path or a straight line, but that's not the answer here. Even putting a straight drop in the beginning, which does increase length, actually reduces time. But the absolute minimum time comes when you take a piece of that cycloid, flip it upside down, and make it bigger here, and use that as the slide that shape will win every single time. Now this is derived through something called the calculus of variations. In calculus one, you learn how to find points that have maximum or minimum y values, where if you just move a bit in any direction from that spot, the y value, in this case, decreases. Well, calculus of variations is used when you need to find entire curves that have an optimal something. That something could be distance, where this straight line is a minimum, or it could also be time, where the brachistochrone curve is a minimum. And if you wiggle that curve in any way, the associated time would guaranteed go up, meaning the original curve is in fact the minimum. But it's not just time and distance you can optimize. For example, take the catenary curve. I've talked about this before, but still, real quick. If you asked a typical high school student what shape this makes when you have a cable hung from two fixed points, I think most of them would say a parabola, and that's very close. But this actually is a catenary curve whose equation is this here. Now how this is derived is through the calculus of variations, and that's because this minimizes something, and that something is potential energy. I forgot to explicitly state this, but since potential energy is a function of height, then minimizing this essentially means a cable wants to, quote, hang the lowest. Okay, now back in. So if you took these two fixed points and drew every single curve of this length, the length of the uh, cable, or at least the part between these two points, and drew every curve with that length going from here to here, and added up all their potential energies at every little point, they would all have some value, but this, this catenary curve, is the one that has the minimum value, and that is the shape that the cable takes. Besides just hanging cables, the catenary curve is seen in architecture, for example, because of the structural properties that it offers. 
Now, where a regular parabola does show up is when you throw an object through the air, at least near the surface of the Earth. But what's cool is even this minimizes something that can be found with the calculus of variations. It's not obvious at all, but it turns out if you find the kinetic energy, or 1 half mv squared, at some point, and the potential energy, mgh, then subtract them, and do that for every point along the curve, and add or really integrate the results, that value will be a minimum for this parabolic curve. You could do the same thing for every curve that could possibly exist between points A and B, and assuming the total time is the same for all of them, if you added up all the kinetic minus potential energies at every point, the minimum sum would be for the parabola, which is the path the object takes. Gives you a totally different way to think about motion rather than F equals MA. Now the shortest distance between two points on some surface has a more specific name actually, and that's a geodesic, which isn't usually very simple to find. If I asked you to find the shortest path from point A to point B, that's not too exciting because it's obviously a straight line. But that simplicity goes away when you have curved surfaces. So now I can't really curve this that well, but here, curved surface. If you want to find the shortest path or the geodesic from point A to point B, requiring that you have to move along the paper, how would we find that? Well, that isn't super easy to do. However, in this case it is, because that geodesic path is gonna be the exact same thing. And the reason for that is geodesics are preserved under certain smooth transformations. So because I knew this was the shortest path, straight line of course, then I know, no matter how I deform this, this is still gonna be the shortest path from point A to point B. And I also discussed in a previous video with my handy oatmeal, that you can wrap a piece of paper around a cylinder without having any distortion or crumpling or anything like that. So if I wanted to find, hey, what's the shortest path from point A to point B moving along the cylinder, it's gonna be the spiral that moves along the side here. And that's because, again, I knew this was the shortest path. And this is a smooth transformation which preserves the geodesic, therefore this is still the shortest path. And again, it's not easy to find these in general, but this was a big part of Einstein's general theory of relativity because photons, for example, travel along geodesic curves in space-time. Now, on top of what we've seen so far, there are several other famous curves out there, some applied and some just interesting, but might have to save those for another time. For those who want to continue learning about how math applies to the real world, though, I recommend checking out CuriosityStream, the sponsor of today's video. One documentary they have that extends beyond what we saw here is The Secret Life of Chaos, which explores the mathematics of, of course, chaos theory. This goes into detail about some of the patterns that appear in nature as well as mathematics itself, and you'd be surprised just how many applications there are to chaos theory. CuriosityStream hosts thousands of other documentaries and nonfiction titles as well, so whether you want to learn about black holes and astrophysics, or future methods of transportation, all the way to ancient history and more, this platform will have exactly what you're looking for. It's also available on a variety of platforms worldwide including Roku, Android, Xbox One, Amazon Fire, Apple TV, and more, and it only comes out to $2.99 per month. Plus, if you go to curiositystream.com slash ZachStar or click the link below and use the promo code ZachStar, you'll get your first month's membership completely free, so no risk in just giving it a shot. And this gives you unlimited access to top documentaries and nonfiction titles that I know many of you will find very interesting. So again, links are below, and with that, I'm going to end that video there. Thanks as always to my supporters on Patreon, social media links to follow me are down below, and I'll see you guys in the next video.